before I start, Ari, uh, we are having one more session next week, I believe, right? That is correct. Part three is uh, next right. week. Same time. Right. I'll make sure. Good. Well, good to see uh, all of you or some of you. Uh, we're going to explore a passage from the Zohar today on dreams. But in order to make sense of it, uh, I want to look with you at the diagram of the Sfirot. I'm going to uh, share my screen and some of you may have this, this PDF. Uh, this is the 10 Sefirot, the 10 qualities of God or aspects of God. This, you might say, is a depiction of the divine qualities, the divine attributes. It's very strange to have a picture of God that really is impossible in the Jewish tradition. After all, the Ten Commandments say, do not make any image, do not bow down to any image. So really what we should say is that the ultimate reality of God is not contained within any of these ten spheres uh, entirely. The ultimate reality of God is the white space behind them and then extending off in all directions to infinity, because really God is infinite, according to Jewish tradition, according to many religious traditions, according to Kabbalah. The word for infinity in Hebrew is en sof, there is no end. So en sof is the ultimate divine being, the ultimate divine reality. These sefirot are aspects of that hidden, concealed, divine. Uh, this would certainly take us the entire time to go through all these. We're not going to go through them in any detail. Really, the passage we're going to look at uh, today focuses on, on the last of these sefirot, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, Malchut. But let me just very briefly give you a description of, of what these are, the sefirot. You can picture the spherot in two ways. One is from below to above. You could see them as a, a ladder of ascension. In fact, that Hebrew phrase, sulam ha'aliyah, appears in the Kabbalistic tradition. It's a ladder of ascension from the earth, from the human realm to the divine, exploring the various qualities of God. The journey would begin then with the last of the ten spherot, malchut or shekhinah. I think she's known as, as, as Shekhinah or Malchut. Uh, and that is the divine presence. The word Shekhinah means presence. The word Malchut means kingdom. In Kabbalah, this is the feminine side of God. You might say the female half of God. And this is one of the ten Sefirot, but she is one of the main figures in the Zohar. And the drama of the Zohar centers on the romance between Shekhinah and Tiferet the sphira in the middle here, Tiferet. Okay, Tiferet uh, is the masculine, Malchut or Shechina is the feminine, and their union is the goal of this whole system, to unite the masculine half of God with the feminine half of God. That is the challenge of Jewish religion, according to Kabbalah. Every good deed that you do brings the divine couple together, any mindless or harmful or evil deed splits the divine couple, divorces the male from the female. So the very first sefira is keter, which means crown. You could picture it as a crown on the divine organism because the sefirot really are depicted in the form of a, of a body, an androgynous body, both male and female, tiferet, masculine, malchut, feminine, this is all one organism within God because God is one. Even though these seem like different qualities, they are parts, they are components, they are aspects of the one God. So Keter is the crown on the head. Chochma and Bina, the next two Sfirot, are the divine mind. God's thinking, God's contemplating. Chochma is seen as masculine, Bina as feminine. Bina is the divine mother. Bina gives birth to the seven lower sefirot, the seven lower qualities. And in general, the Kabbalah says, don't venture too far. Don't even try to explore this hidden realm of the highest sefirot of Keter, Chochma, and Bina. Start with the sefirot from the next level, the next rung, Chesed, divine love. Its opposite would be Gevurah, divine power. 
or din, judgment. It's also known as pachad, fear. So think of love and fear, these opposites of love and fear. This is, these are divine qualities, but they are also human qualities. We feel love, we feel fear, right? We project those qualities onto God. So much of theology is projection, but what makes the Zohar especially intriguing is that the Zohar moves back and forth constantly between the human and the divine. So this is a depiction of divine qualities, but it teaches us something about our own inner workings, our own inner dynamics. If you can balance love and awe, love and fear, then you end up at a place of harmony, which is Tiferet. Tiferet is seen as balancing the love of God and the harsh judgment of God. And the next spherot are spoken of very rarely in the Zohar, but the passage we're going to look at today does allude to them. Netzach and Hod, literally endurance and splendor. You could think of them as minor variations, minor replications of chesed and gevura. Netzach on the right conveys something of the divine love. Hod on the left conveys something of that opposite divine power. But in the Zohar, they are seen as the source of prophecy. And that will come up in the passage we're going to look at shortly. Netzach and Hod channel the divine light to the prophet. Now, the prophet doesn't necessarily reach this level. The prophet is still human. The prophet is beneath Malchut, beneath Shechina. But the prophet draws on the power, the emanation from Netzach and Hod, channeled through Yesod, the divine phallus. Tiferet and Yesod together are the masculine entity within God. And then that prophetic inspiration, that prophetic flow reaches Shechina or Malchut. And the prophet experiences prophecy uh, beneath Malchut, but drawing on Netzach and Hod. Beneath Malchut are various angelic realms. And the Zohar is going to mention some of them today, specifically Gavriel, Michael and Gabriel, Michael and Gavriel, are two of the archangels, two of the main angels in Jewish and Christian and Islamic tradition. And they inhabit the realm beneath Malchut, beneath Shechina. So the angel Gabriel, the angel Gabriel is going to make an appearance in the passage today as well. Okay, that's just a few highlights of the Sfirot. We can talk about that later when questions come up, but I wanna move immediately to uh, the Zohar passage. Uh, for today. And some of you have the PDF, but I'm going to share it here. This is the page of Zohar. In a minute, I'm going to enlarge it so that we can read it, read the text more clearly. But I just want to show you, uh, I want to show you the full page here for a moment. Um, many of you have this or have one volume of this edition. This is my translation of the Zohar, the Zohar Pritzker edition. The entire work is 12 volumes, of which I completed the first nine, two other scholars working under, uh, with my guidance, uh, completed volumes 10 through 12. Volumes one through nine I composed, and those nine volumes cover the Zohar's commentary on the Torah. So we're looking at volume three of the Zohar Pritzker edition, because this Joseph story is uh, further on in the book of Genesis. The first three volumes of the Zohar Pritzker edition cover Genesis. The next three volumes cover Exodus. And volumes uh, seven through nine cover the rest of the Torah, Leviticus through Deuteronomy. So we're in volume three of the Zohar Pritzker edition. This is the Zohar's commentary on the story of Joseph. Just to help you navigate the page, the top it says the Zohar. Over here is the original Aramaic pagination but uh, we're working with English page numbers, with Arabic page numbers here, page 114 in volume three. Anything in italics is a quote from the Bible. Okay, all biblical verses are put in italics here, as you can immediately see when a verse is being quoted. The top part of the page is the Zohar. The bottom part of the page is my commentary. Sometimes, as you see, there's more commentary than Zohar, but that's because the Zohar is so dense. We're going to begin reading the text and then move down to uh, the commentary. So um, let me just enlarge this a little so that uh, people can see the text more clearly.
Okay, this is the text of the Zohar. It begins, Joseph dreamed a dream from Genesis chapter 37. And let me read to you a few verses uh, so that we'll get the biblical context. The Zohar, after all, is a commentary on the Torah. It's not a systematic book of mysticism. It moves through the Torah verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And it's important to have a Bible in front of you when you're studying the Zohar so you can see what the Zohar is drawing on. So I'm going to read from chapter 37, uh, beginning verse 5. Joseph is uh, a son of Jacob, but Joseph's brothers resent him because Jacob uh, favors Joseph more than any of his other children. Uh, for example, Jacob uh, makes for Joseph the coat of many colors, some special ornamented tunic that Joseph has, and his brothers are very jealous. But the brothers are even more spiteful toward Joseph because of this dream that Joseph has. This is chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 5. I'm reading from Robert Alter's translation of the Bible, which I highly recommend. It's the best translation there is of the Bible in English, it's just called the Hebrew Bible, three volumes. I'm reading from volume one, which is the Torah. Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. He said to them, listen, please, to this dream that I have dreamed. Look, we were binding sheaves in the field. And look, my sheaf arose and actually stood up. And look, your sheaves drew round and bowed to my sheaf. That's his dream. He dreams that they're all in the field. They're binding the sheaves of wheat. Joseph's sheaf stands up tall and all of the brother's sheaves bow down to Joseph's sheep. The brother, his brother said to him, do you mean to reign over us? Do you mean to rule us? And they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Okay, that's enough of the biblical text to get us going. So how does the Zohar continue? Rabbi Chia opened. Okay, this is one of the scholars of the Zohar, one of the companions of Rabbi Shimon, the hero of the Zohar. He's going to interpret this verse in Genesis, but the way you interpret a verse in Jewish tradition is by quoting another verse. So Rabbi Chia quotes another verse that mentions the word dream from the book of Numbers. Rabbi Chia opened, he said, hear my words. If there be among you a prophet of yud heh in a vision I make myself known to him. In a dream I speak with him. So this is the book of Numbers, where actually God is comparing Moses to all the other prophets. He's contrasting all other prophets to whom God might appear in a vision or in a dream, whereas to Moses, God appears directly. But the reason this is important here, and the reason Rabbi Chia quotes the verse, is because it seems to be saying prophecy can come through a dream. So there's some connection, there's some relation between prophecy and dream. Come and see how many rungs upon rungs the Blessed Holy One has made, all standing one atop the other, rung upon rung, this above that, all absorbing suitably, these on the right, those on the left, each appointed over another, all fittingly. Okay, what are these rungs? First of all, notice the Zohar says, come and see, it's the favorite formula of the Zohar. Let's look more deeply into this. Let's see what else is going on beneath the surface layer of the text of the Bible. So rungs upon rungs. He's really talking here about those ten sefirot, those qualities of God, which are seen as rungs upon a ladder. The Zohar never uses the word sefirot. I don't think once in the whole Zohar, if certainly fewer than, than a few times. Whenever the Zohar wants to refer to Sfirot, it uses various images, various metaphors. One of its favorite is rungs. So when, it, when the Zohar says rung, it often means Sefira. Not always, but usually. Uh, take a look down at the note here. You'll see, we're not going to look at all the notes, but I want to show you how to use these notes. This is note 189, so down below here on the left. Rungs upon rungs within the network of Sfirot. And throughout the entire chain of being, lower rungs absorb the flow of emanation from the higher. 
So this includes the sirot and then continuing the chain of being all the way to the earthly realm. Right and left, why does the Zohar mention right and left? Because he's alluding here to chesed and din, right? Those two polar opposite sirot on the right chesed, on the left din judgment, the two poles of divine being whose opposite qualities color the world. Get back to the Zohar. Come and see. All prophets of the world absorb from a single facet through two known rungs. Okay, what is he saying here? Let's take a look down at, at note 190. All prophets of the world absorb. Prophecy derives from the divine flow, channeled through the spherotic pair, Netzach and Hod, which are considered a single field of prophetic vision. And let's uh, look back at that diagram of the spherot. So he's saying prophets draw from Netzach and Hod, those two rungs, uh, through a single field. This may mean that single field of prophecy, it may mean through Malchut, through Shrinad. Prophet absorbs the inspiration through from these two spherot, but conveyed through Shrina. Okay, continuing in the text, those rungs. Those rungs appeared through a dim glass, as is written, Bamar'ah, in a vision, I make myself known to him. Right, the verse from Numbers that he quoted up here, he's just bringing part of that verse again. Who is Mar'ah, as has been said, a mirror in which all colors appear? This is the dim glass. Okay, this may seem very uh, hard to follow, and it's intentionally so. The Zohar is a cryptic text. The Zohar does not come out and say what it means. It uses poetry, it uses imagery, it uses illusions and illusions. Everything is uh, a secret that needs to be unpacked. That's why there's so many notes here. Let's look a few a few of these notes. Through a dim glass, this is Shrina. Shrina is known as the mirror that does not shine or the dim glass. Take a look down at note uh, 191. Uh, this is a little technical for us here, but just look at this quote from the Talmud. All the prophets gaze through a dim glass, literally an ispaklaria that does not shine. Okay, that's the Aramaic word, ispaklaria. From, it's really based on the, the Latin speculum. Okay, speculum can mean uh, a mirror, right? So the ispaklaria means a glass, a mirror, a lens that does not shine. I translated it a dim glass, but it literally is the mirror that does not shine, the lens that does not shine. And what does it say in the Talmud? All the prophets gazed through a dim glass, through ispaklaria that does not shine, whereas Moses, our teacher, gazed through a clear glass, an ispaklaria that shines. So this, this phrase is used in the Talmud to speak about prophecy. Prophets see through, prophets see somehow not with total clarity. Moses saw more clearly, the prophets see through a dim glass, through an ispaklaria that doesn't convey all the image perfectly. Okay, in the Zohar, Shechina is the dim glass, the speculum that does not shine on its own. I'm just reading the note here, but rather reflects and transmits the other sirut. Here, she is the medium through which the prophet perceives his, his spherotic vision. Okay, so that's what he means here. All prophets of the world absorb through a single facet, through two known rungs, those two spherot. Those rungs appear through Shechina, the mirror that does not shine, as is written, Bamara in a vision. But that word Mara can also mean mirror. So he's interpreting the verse in the book of Numbers that God appears in a vision to mean God appears in a mirror, specifically in the mirror in which all colors appear. We said Shechina is the mirror that does not shine, but on the more positive side, she reflects all of the colors of the spherot. She doesn't reflect her own light. In that sense, she does not shine, but she conveys the light of all the spherot. And here she conveys the prophetic image, the prophetic vision from above, from Netzach and Ho, to the human prophets below. Let's continue with the Zohar. In a dream, I speak with him. I think that's how God said in the book of Numbers, God's 
conveys prophecy often in a dream. But the Zohar says here, one sixtieth of prophecy as has been established. What does that mean? As has been established, it often means as the rabbis taught in the Talmud. Let me take a look down here at 193, one sixtieth of prophecy. According to the Talmud, BT is Babylonian Talmud. The very first volume of the Talmud is Barachot, blessings. A dream is one sixtieth of prophecy. A dream is one sixtieth of prophecy. So that's not invented by the Zohar. The Zohar are just borrowing it from the Talmud. That's why the Zohar says, as has been established in the Talmud. So why one sixtieth? Because the Babylonian Talmud uses the number system current in Babylon, which was base 60. And it's almost like, really like we would say 1%. Babylonian mathematics is 160. We would say 1%. Of course, we still use the base 60 for hours, 60 minutes in an hour for measuring angles, uh, for GPS. But we can translate this to 1%. A dream is one fraction of prophecy. So what does that mean? If you have a dream, something is coming to you, but it's one sixtieth of a prophetic vision. It's not total, totally clear, totally full. Maybe it's not totally accurate. It's just a, uh, a taste, a fraction of prophecy. So that's from the Talmud, basically. But now the Zohar adds a new element. It is the sixth rung from that rung of prophecy, rung of Gabriel, appointed over dreams, as already explained. The Zohar likes to do that. It says something totally unexplained, unclear, and it says, as has been explained, as if, you know, this has already been talked about. This is basic, but to us, it seems totally confusing. So what does this mean, the sixth rung from prophecy? Let's uh, take a look here at the, at the diagram. The sixth rung from prophecy, Netzach was the beginning of prophecy. That would be one. Hod is two. Yesod is three, Malchut is four. What comes beneath Malchut? The angels, Michael, Gabriel. So Gabriel, who's appointed over dreams, is six steps away from the beginning of prophecy. Netzach, Hod, Yesod, Malchut is four. Michael, the archangel, Michael, Gabriel, the archangel, Gabriel. The Zohar is telling us that in its cryptic, poetic way. It is the sixth rung from the rung of prophecy, rung of Gabriel, appointed over dreams. Who is Gabriel? Uh, he's mentioned in the book of Daniel, as I say down here in note 194. The book of Daniel, Gabriel interprets dreams. Here he becomes the master of dreams. He's appointed over dreams. Come and see. We're on the second page of the PDF now, uh, page 115. Come and see. Every seemly dream proceeds from this rung. Okay, from, uh, you know, he may mean from Netzach or he may mean from Gabriel. Every seemly dream proceeds from this rung. So you cannot have a dream without false material intermingling, as they have established. You can't have a dream without false material. Look at note 195. Yeah, so Gabriel appointed over dreams, stands beneath Shekhinah. So Gabriel is outside of the purely divine realm, which means that demonic forces nearby can smuggle in false images. The dream is contaminated by falsehood. How can the dream have anything false if the dream comes from God, if the dream somehow is rooted in the divine? Because it has to move through various stages from Netzach to Hod, to Yesod, to Shekhinah, to Michael, to Gabriel, it's six steps removed. Why does he want six? Because of 60. Okay, remember he said that a dream is one sixtieth of prophecy. Now that fraction one sixtieth is being translated into mystical numbers. So we move from one sixtieth to six. That's why I think he's playing with six and Gabriel being six stages away from the beginning of prophecy in the sphere. Back to the Zohar. Consequently, some of them are true and some are false. Some dreams are true, some are false. You cannot have a dream that does not contain both this side and that. You can't have a dream that doesn't have false material because the dream comes, the dream traverses some territory outside of the divine realm. 
before it reaches our mind. Since a dream includes all, as we have said, all dreams of the world follow oral interpretation. What does that mean? All dreams of the world follow oral interpretation. This has been established for it is written as he interpreted to us. So it was. Where is that from? You can tell it's a verse because it's in italics, right? Everything in italics is from the Bible. This is from Genesis as well. But later in Genesis, just a few chapters later, Joseph is sold down to Egypt, sold by his brothers. He becomes a servant in the house of Potiphar. You may remember Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. Joseph withstands the temptation, is not seduced. But despite that, he ends up in jail. And when he's in jail, he interprets dreams of two of Pharaoh's ministers who have been sent to prison. And one of those for whom he interprets the dream later is restored to Pharaoh's service. And he tells Pharaoh, I know someone who can interpret your dreams. Pharaoh also has a dream he's very troubled by. And he asks his interpreters, can you interpret it? Nobody can. But Pharaoh's minister, the chief uh, wine steward, uh, tells Pharaoh, I remember when I was in prison, Joseph interpreted our dreams. A Hebrew lad interpreted our dreams, and he now can help you with your dreams. So how does that show you that all dreams follow an oral interpretation? Let's look at note 196. Uh, note 195 is interesting too. Just look at the, here, 195, the, this paragraph from the Talmud. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon, son of Yochai, right? The hero of the Zohar, Shimon bar Yochai. This is an actual statement attributed to Rabbi Shimon in the Talmud. Just as there cannot be wheat without straw, so there cannot be a dream without nonsense. Okay, the Zohar says there's falsehood in the dream. Rabbi Shimon says there's nonsense in the dream. That's the Talmudic source. But 196, all dreams of the world follow oral interpretation. The true meaning of a dream depends on its interpretation. Look at the power there that's given to interpreting. The true meaning of a dream depends on its interpretation. It's a remarkable statement. And here, too, there's a parallel in the Talmud, same tractate. These pages of the first tractate, 55, Okay, pages 55 to 58, I think, a few pages in the Talmud are filled with material on dreams. Rabbi Elazar said in the Talmud, how do we know that all dreams follow the mouth of the interpreter? And how do you know that interpretation determines the dream? Because it is said, as he interpreted to us, so it was. This verse spoken by the wine steward describing Joseph's mastery of dream interpretation is quoted to show that interpretation is decisive. Okay, this is Pharaoh's chief cupbearer describing how accurately Joseph interpreted his dream. Okay, so the, so the Zohar is saying dreams need an interpretation. Why? Because a dream contains falsehood and truth, and the word controls all. So a dream needs favorable interpretation. Let's look at note 197. The word of the interpreter possesses the power to actualize one of the possible meanings of the dream, for better or for worse. Okay, the dream could mean various things. And once an interpretation is given, that becomes decisive. You know, think of this uh, psychologically. You have a dream. You ask somebody what the dream means. They tell you what it means. Maybe it meant that. Maybe it didn't mean that. But if somebody says this is what it means, that can be very powerful, sometimes too powerful. Uh, the dream can, in, can determine, the interpretation can determine what the dream means. So that's all Rabbi Chia. Rabbi Yehuda said, back to the Zohar, because every dream is of the rung below, controlled by speech. So every dream follows speech. What does this mean? Every dream is of the rung below. Every dream comes from that angel Gabriel. Gabriel is controlled by Shekhinah, who's known as speech. One of her many names, she is speech. She conveys the divine word. The whole, you could say, the whole system of the Sfirot is seen as God speaking. God's mind, Chochma and Bina, right? Then uh, Bina is also seen as the, as the throat, Tiferet as the voice, but not yet an articulated voice. Malchut, Shekhinah, 
is articulated speech. So the process of emanation is the process of God's word being pronounced. And that finally happens through Shrina. So she is called speech Dibur. She is called speech. And that's why our speech is important here. Every dream follows human speech because human speech triggers divine speech. Look at note 198. Rung below controlled by speech. Gabriel, the rung below, is controlled by Shrina, who conveys the divine word and is known as speech. According to Rabbi Yehuda, human interpretation is effective because it activates divine speech. Shrina, who then translates the dream into reality. That's the process the Zohar sees here. Okay, so Rabbi Yehuda related it to Shechina because of speech, human speech and divine speech. Now Rabbi Yehuda gives his further view. He opened. He opened his talk. He opened the verse up. He opened himself. He opened saying. Now another biblical verse about dreaming from Job. In a dream, a vision of night, when deep sleep falls upon humans, in slumber upon the bed, he then uncovers human ears and with a warning, terrifies them. Okay, what's terrifying a person? Something in a dream, maybe uh, predicting some disaster, some message that comes to you in a dream. That's how Job describes uh, what could happen in a dream. Come and see. When a person climbs into bed, he should first enthrone and acknowledge the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? He should recite the Shema. By reciting the Shema, when you go to sleep, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's called in rabbinic texts, uh, accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. Acknowledging the kingdom of heaven. By reciting the Shema, as I say in note 199, by reciting the Shema, you enthrone God. You're accepting God as the universal ruler. So when you climb into bed, you should say the Shema, then recite a verse of compassion, a certain verse that the Talmud identifies. Uh, it's a note already on the next page. It's up from Psalm 31.6. Into your hand, I entrust my spirit. You redeem me, yud God of truth. Biyadcha afkid ruchi. Into your hand, I entrust my spirit. Beautiful verse. And that's considered part of the evening ritual in bed to recite the Shema and then to recite a verse of compassion. For when a human sleeps upon his bed, his soul leaves him and goes wandering above, each in its own way, ascending so, as has been said. Okay, when you're sleeping in bed, your body is asleep, your soul is sailing through heaven, wandering through heaven. Uh, probably he means each in its own way, according to its conduct, depending on how it's acted during the day, it's able to explore certain regions of heaven that may be implied here. What is written in a dream, a vision of night, when people lie asleep in bed and the soul leaves them? As is written, in slumber upon the bed, he then uncovers human ears. Okay, God gives a message. Through the dream, God uncovers human ears. God speaks into a person through the dream, thereby uncovering the ear, unblocking the ear. How does that happen? <clears throat> then the Blessed Holy One informs the soul through Gabriel, through the rung presiding over dreams. Notice the Zohar avoids naming the Sphirot, or even avoids naming the angels, wants to be as cryptic as possible, the rung presiding over dreams. We only know that it, that means Gabriel because we saw it on the previous page. The Zohar does not make it easy. The Zohar is intentionally cryptic, as I said. So God informs the soul through Gabriel of things destined to, be, to befall the world or of things corresponding to the mind's imaginings so that one will follow a path of admonishment in the world. So God is giving admonishment. God is giving warning about what might happen, how a person should, should work on his or her own character. How do those messages come? They might be uh, a message of what will happen, what will befall the world. They might be corresponding to the mind's imaginings. What does that mean? The dream could be corresponding to the mind's imagining. This is 
based on another statement in the same place in the Talmud, Brachot 55, Rabbi Shmuel son of Nachmani said, a person is shown in his dreams only his mind's imaginings. Very interesting statement. Very, this is very Freudian, about as Freudian as you could get. Uh, what you're shown in a dream, according to this statement in the Talmud, is simply what you've been thinking about during the day, maybe what you've been repressing, what you've been thinking or what you've been trying not to think, what's been going on in your mind or right beneath the surface in your subconscious. That's what comes out in a dream. Amazing statement. This is from a rabbi in the third century of the common era in the Babylonian Talmud, but very close to what Freud would say. you would say it's one of the one of the bases of Freud's whole dream theory is right here in this line. So sometimes it can be a future prediction. Sometimes it can be reflecting what's been going on in your mind's imaginings so that one will follow the path. Okay, and the, the point of this, back to the end of this note 203, the prefiguring of the future serves as, as admonishment to the dreamer to return to the straight path as suggested by Bajou. Continuing in the Zohar here. For one is not informed while in a state of bodily vigor. You're not given this message when you're awake. Okay, bodily vigor means when you're awake, only when you're asleep. When you're asleep, the body is quiescent. The soul is free to roam above. The soul can hear this message. An awake body can't, can't perceive it. Rather, an angel informs the soul and the soul informs the person. And that dream derives from above when souls leave the body and ascend each in its own way. How many rungs upon rungs in the mystery of a dream, all in the mystery of wisdom. Come and see, dream one rung, vision one rung, prophecy one rung. What does he mean there? Dream, Gabriel, vision, Shechina, prophecy, Netzach, and Hod. Okay, just one more time here. Dream. Gabriel, vision, malchut or shechina, prophecy, netzach and hod. So he's playing with the spherot. He's hinting at the spherot, dream one rung. Again, rung often means sphira. Vision one rung, prophecy one rung. All rungs upon rungs, one above another. Now we come to Joseph. Okay, look how long it's taken him to get to Joseph. Actually, one rabbi began, now the second rabbi continues and finally comes Back to the verse we're, we're supposed to be interpreting. Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Okay, the dream of the sheaf, Joseph sheaf, and the brothers bowing down, the brother's sheaves bowing down to Joseph sheaf. From here we learn that a person should tell his dream only to one who loves him. You shouldn't tell your dream to someone who doesn't like you. Why? Otherwise, he may prove decisive for that if that dream changes tone, he is the cause. What does that mean? Otherwise, that person, that person you've told the dream to who doesn't like you, that person might prove decisive because the dream could change tone based on your enemy's interpretation. Remember the power of the word, the power of interpretation. The interpretation can determine what the dream means. Look at note 207. Otherwise, he may prove decisive. If the dreamer tells his dream to someone who hates him, this enemy can harm him by the spiteful tone of his interpretation, which affects the fulfillment of the dream. And we'll see this now with how the brothers interpreted Joseph's dream. Okay, it changes tone. What does that mean? The dream could mean one thing or another thing. The dream is somewhat open-ended, but an interpretation freezes the meaning into one, either positive or negative. It could change tone. It could take on a specific tone. Come and see. We're near the end of the passage now. Come and see. Since Joseph told his dream to his brothers, they caused it to be postponed, delaying it for 22 years. Now, what is this talking about? Joseph, the dream is that the brothers will bow down to Joseph. That eventually happens. You may remember Eventually, the, jo the brothers, Joseph's brothers go down to Egypt to find grain because there's drought, there's famine, and they don't realize it. But Joseph, who now is a viceroy to the king, 
they have to come to Joseph to ask for grain. They come to Joseph. He knows who they are, but they don't know who he is. They bow down to him, thinking they're bowing down to the viceroy of Egypt, but they're actually bowing down to Joseph as Joseph's dream predicted 22 years earlier. According to biblical, biblical chronology or rabbinic understanding of biblical chronology, that, that took 22 years. Look at note 208, page 117, the left-hand column, note 208. The first dream recounted by Joseph, which we read, look, we were binding sheaves in the field, and look, my sheaf arose and actually stood up, and look, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. As indicated by Rabbi Levi in the Talmud, notice the same pages again, the dream material in Brachot. It took 22 years for this dream to be fulfilled. In other words, for Joseph's brothers to bow down to him in Egypt, as described later in Genesis. Okay, so they, because Joseph told his dream to his brothers and they disliked him, they enabled the dream to be delayed. They messed with the dream. Maybe otherwise the brothers would have bowed to him right away. It took 22 years because Joseph made the mistake of telling it to his brothers who disliked him. But Rabbi Yossi now adds something else. Rabbi Yossi said, how do we know this? Because it is written they hated him even more. Right When he told him that dream, they hated him even more. What does hated him mean? They provoked accusers against him. They stimulated negative forces. They stimulated demonic powers up in heaven who, could, who delayed the dream. That's what it says in the note. What is written? He said to them, listen, please, to this dream that I dreamed, begging them to listen. Then he revealed that dream to him. Right, The dream that, that we know, the sheaves bowing down. If they had transformed its tone, okay, they could have changed the meaning of the dream. If they had transformed its tone, so it would have been fulfilled. They could have made the dream mean something else. But how did they respond? They responded by saying, will you really reign over us? Will you really rule over us? Suddenly they had told him the interpretation of the dream in acting a decree. That is why they hated him even more. So what's going on here? The Zohar is saying, because Joseph's brother said, will you really reign over us? By saying that, by verbalizing that, they made that into what the dream meant. That's what the dream could have meant. We think that's what the dream did mean. But because they said it, they sealed their fate. They enacted a decree. They put it into words. They, they mouthed that meaning. And that meaning then held. Look at uh, note 211, this is page 117, the left-hand column. If they had transformed its tone, if the brothers had interpreted the dream unfavorably for Joseph, it would have been fulfilled accordingly. However, their spontaneous, hateful response, will you reign over us? Guaranteed that the dream would be actualized precisely that way by Joseph's dominance. By verbally expressing this interpretation, they had sealed both their fate and his. Realizing what they had done to themselves, they hated Joseph all the more. Okay, that seems to be the, the last element Rabbi Yossi is adding. They realized what they had done. They, 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 they spurted it out. They, they let out the meaning of the dream. Then they were stuck with it. So they hated him all the more because they had sealed their fate. Let's stop the share now and... Uh, open it up to discussion. A lot of material here, a lot of ideas. Um, I see a lot of things in the chat. Maybe Ari can start us off and then- Yeah, there are some any, great, great input. Like. I think Zoom has, has changed my ability because if there's too much chatting, I, I can turn it off and control it, but this week has not enabled me to do it. So sure, fine. The, the good news is it allows people to chat and it's been a generally very good chat. And the, the challenge is people are, are trying to focus on so many different things. It does frustrate everybody, some people. So. That being said, so um, there was a great uh, question. Uh, this, this dreams and ladders uh, um, was an obvious reference or tied into Jacob's ladder to some of our people here. So um, I wanted you to comment on that, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting because Jacob's ladder, of course, is a dream, right? Jacob dreams of, of a ladder. He doesn't climb the ladder, but he's dreaming of a ladder. And here we have uh, the image of ladder with dream. So that's that's a wonderful connection. Uh, I see one thing in the chat I want to respond to right away. Yeah, someone already answered it partly. 
we see a lot of masculine names in the Sfirot. What about feminine names? Uh, let's, let's take a look at this. So are, are, there, are, there, are there women in the Sfirot? Uh, and and there, are, there are certain women, uh, mainly with Shekhinah, as you, might, as you might guess, Malchut. Okay, her technical name is Malchut, but I'm referring her to her as, as Shekhinah. So various uh, women, biblical female heroes are, are associated with Shekhinah, especially Sarah, Sarah, Abraham's wife. Uh, Esther, Queen Esther, uh, other other women as well, but Leah, Rachel, Rachel, uh, who is the, the mother of Joseph, Jacob's wife, Rachel, is associated with Malchut. Jacob's other wife, Leah, is associated with Bina, which is interesting. Rachel is more of a positive figure, is much more of a hero in Jewish tradition than Leah, and Rachel is, is presented, is portrayed more positively in the Torah than, than Leah is. Uh, but Leah reaches a higher rung in the Kabbalah. Leah is Bina, maybe because she's more hidden. Uh, there's allusions to, the, to Leah being hidden, and Bina is a more hidden realm than Malchut. So you do have feminine imagery. Look, we have to say this. The, the, the Kabbalah was created almost entirely, if not entirely, by men. The people who studied it for centuries were almost entirely men. Now that has changed and is changing dramatically, but still we have to be aware of the masculine bias of this whole system, and that applies to all of Western religious thought. Judaism, Christianity, Islam uh, are all very patriarchal, and that's changing uh, not quickly enough, but uh, in very significant ways. So this question of gender is is a constant, uh, constant thing we, we have to address and confront. Right. There, um, the question about Michael and Gabriel, do they appear a lot in the Zohar or is this a unique reference? Uh, not, not that often. The Zohar uh, does have angels, but it doesn't specify Michael and Gabriel that often. Uh, sometimes it prefers stranger names. There are many other angels. There, there are whole encyclopedias, you know, dictionaries of angels. You can find more in Hebrew, but, but some in, in English too. Uh, Zohar doesn't refer to angels so often in its main text, but then there are parts of the Zohar that are that have more angelic material. The role Michael, of- and, to say, Michael and Gabriel go back to earlier tradition, and Gabriel is mentioned in the Bible in the book of Daniel. Michael, I believe, is also mentioned a couple times in the Bible. Uh, and then in, in rabbinic literature, you have four archangels Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel. But Michael and Gabriel are the two major archangels in, in rabbinic tradition. So we talked about, I think we talked about prophets and their ability to interpret dreams, right? I mean, so I wanted to tie that in. And, um, but we also know that our tradition says that there's no more prophecy. So does that mean that people can't interpret dreams now anymore? How does that, how does prophets and their interpretation of dreams fit into this whole yeah. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's not it's not so much the prophets interpret dreams. I mean, that you do find it in the book of Daniel. There are there are dreams, and then Gabriel helps to interpret the dream. There's what the Zohar is saying. Well, let's start with that line, that that amazing line in the Talmud: uh, "A dream is one sixtieth of prophecy." So you might say we don't have prophecy anymore. We have little hints of prophecy. One of the ways you get a hint of prophecy is in a dream. So a dream is a fraction of of prophecy. Uh, but then the question of interpreting the dream, you know, what's, what's significant in the Zohar passage is that human interpretation has great power. You're, you're not so much waiting for God to interpret the dream. You're, you're trying to find out what the dream means. So you have to be careful who you tell your dream to. Okay, so people who use uh, psychoanalysis, be careful who you pick to be your analyst. It has to be someone who, who's, you know, who's on your side. Now, you know, that, that could raise... Certainly, people could object to that and argue argue that uh, out of the room very quickly. But the Zohar uh, is is comparing dream to prophecy, but not not equating them. The, as your question, prophecy has ceased. That is a a good rabbinic notion that with the last of the, of the biblical prophets, Malachi, Malachi, prophecy ceased. Not everyone accepted that. In the Middle Ages, you have debates. Could you know, it's called the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. Could Ruach HaKodesh still manifest maybe a slightly lower rung than prophecy, but still being inspiration? Sometimes this is called uh, Bat Kol, 
right? An echo, literally the daughter of a voice. So you don't get God's voice, but you get the daughter of God's voice. You get an echo, a heavenly echo. Somehow that, that's seen as a, a kind of inspiration, a kind of Holy Spirit that could that could make up for the lack of, of prophecy. Alex has been waiting patiently, so I'm going to unmute him to ask his question. Please. Thank you. Hello, Daniel. So my question, if you could say a few words about uh, Sifirot hierarchy, how one should understand it? Is it like uh, the higher rounds or the higher Sifirot more kind of challenging to comprehend, flows, goes from top to down, and specifically the uh, Tiferet is below Givora and uh, Hesed, and how, what does it mean? I'm sorry, what, what was the last thing specifically? What, what about Givorah? Tif Tiferet, Tiferet is, is below uh -huh. Givorah and Hesed. Uh -huh. How uh -huh. do you understand such yeah. images? Yeah, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look again at, at, uh, at the diagram. So, you know, uh, this diagram is very helpful, but it's also problematical because it makes you think that Shekhinah is down here and we go up level by level. Zohar did use the word rungs. I mentioned Sulam Ha'aliyah, the ladder of ascension, it sounds totally hierarchical. At certain points, you have to get rid of this diagram and think of the spherot in other ways, okay? And there are other depictions of the spherot. Uh, maybe next week, we'll, we'll look at a couple. Sometimes you have it as concentric circles, not as rungs of the ladder, but circles. Sometimes malchut is in the middle, sometimes malchut is at the outside. So it's good to, to think of them in, in different possible configurations. And really, you know, if this is encouraging us to explore within, to go within, to go deep within, we shouldn't think only of going from where we are up to heaven. We should look, we should think of going deeper inside the mind, deeper inside the heart, deeper inside your kishkas, you know, looking for the, what, what's really, what's troubling us, what's going on with our inner dynamics. The Zohar is aiming at that. It's not until we get to Hasidism the Hasidic teaching that really turns these spherot into psychology. Think of these as human qualities. Okay, for the Zohar, they're divine qualities and human qualities. Hasidism comes and emphasizes what's going on inside of you. So I would say you, you can gain some insight into the spherot by looking at this chart, but put it aside and think of other ways to imagine the spherot, specifically Tiferet. Tiferet is harmonizing Chesed and Gvura. You could think of it as, you know, as uh, in some sense higher because it's neither right nor left, it's the, it's the balance of, of both of them. But here, the picture here is of a, of a divine light. Okay, divine light is streaming through the spherot, you know, following this pattern and ending up with Shekhinah. And Shekhinah includes all of the colors of the, of the rainbow. Um, I had a question uh, from- I, 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 wanna, I wanna respond to something that I see from my old, uh, High school uh, companion, Neil Eisenberg, if I can get back to it here. Here. Okay. You mentioned Freud. Interesting how that speaking some how that speaking something seems to make it so, right? Putting it into words is so powerful. Sounds a bit like cognitive therapeutic approach where our thoughts about a neutral, even colors who we see, even colors who we see in the world and changes our perspective. Yeah, the power of formulating, the power of saying something. Here the Zohar is applying it specifically to dreams, but really it's something to, to contemplate, how it's so important what you say and how you say it and how you word it. The Zohar speaks of, you know, machshava dibur ma'aseh, thought, speech, action, right? And that continuum uh, is so important to, to, be, to be mindful, to be to be caring, to be loving with the words that, that you say, how harmful they can be, how destructive they can be, how negative they can be. Please, so just, just in our last few minutes, um, there was a question that came up last week and someone had asked me and, and wanted me to bring it up, which is given all your time you've spent studying the Zohar and Kabbalah, are there any other mystical traditions that you would compare Kabbalah to, you know, that you found resonant is Kabbalah? unique mm. is it is it borrowing from other traditions is it talking to other traditions is it informing mm. or being informed by other traditions 
Yeah, I mean, one of the, the fascinating thing about mysticism is, is how you find parallels with other teachings, right? If you find the Zohar says something, and then some Buddhist teacher, also in the 13th century, Dogen, one of the great masters of Zen, is, an exa- is a contemporary with Moses de Leon, with the composer of the Zohar, both in the 13th century. And it, it's very exciting. It's very uplifting to find a parallel in in another text. You find it in Buddhist texts and Sufi texts and Christian texts and Hindu texts because mystics are, um, you know, when you come down to it, finally discovering the same truth, which is that I am part of something greater, right? Uh, Going beyond the normal confines of, of ego consciousness. That's really what mysticism is about. Building a bridge or discovering the connection between your own limited ego and the unnameable, the infinite, God, the divine, energy, whatever you're going to call it. Einstein says this, that the the goal of religion is to realize that we're part of the cosmos. And that journey you see in so many traditions. So to me, um, wherever I find the parallel, I find it exciting. Sometimes I point out parallels in the notes in this addition to Rumi or to to Buddhist teachers. Jesus is a very important source. It's very important for Jews to appreciate the, the wisdom of Jesus, not to worship Jesus, not to become a Jew for Jesus, but to, to realize that Jesus was a Jewish teacher and he is a Jewish mystic. So that's a mysticism that's, that's within Judaism and yet uh, developing into independent tradition. Of course, the bloody history of Jewish-Christian relations makes it very difficult to to appreciate Jesus, but that's important too. So it's, I wouldn't say any one particular faith. Um, there's certain very strong parallels between the Buddhist emphasis on uh, the present, on what's right here, on this, right? You find a lot in Buddhism about uh, thusness, suchness, and Kabbalah gives the word this as one of the names of Shekhinah. Shekhinah is this, Shekhinah is the divine presence right here. Are there any, any, any other places in the Zohar where dreams are discussed, or is this it? Did you just uh, teach us the... the most, this is the most extensive discussion in the Zohar on, on dreams. Uh, I'll recommend a book, uh, Tishby, T-I-S-H-B-Y, Isaiah Tishby, has a book called Wisdom of the Zohar. It's three volumes, but it's in paperback. Um, that's the best place to turn if you want to know what does the Zohar say about X, because he does it by subject. And he probably refers to some other passages, but from what I recall, this is the, the most complete, and it's not that complete, uh, just some intriguing hints, but it's fascinating how the Zohar draws on the Midrash and then moves into Kabbalah and comes down to something very human at the end, that, that relationship between Joseph and his brothers and how the brothers seal their fate by spitting out the, the negative meaning of that dream. Um, I don't know if there's any other thing. There's always lots of stuff we could cover in very limited time. So just from your perspective, do you believe that Cordovero wrote the whole Zohar? In other words, is it one author or is it multiple authors? Yeah, I should say it's not, you know, not Cordovero. Moses Cordovero was a great prolific Kabbalist, but uh, the Moses we're talking about is Moses de Leon. Sorry, I meant de Leon. Yeah, in the 13th century, Moses de Leon and Cordovero was great colleague of Isaac Luria in the next creative, next creative period of Kabbalah in Sfat and Safed. Uh, I think Moses de Leon wrote the bulk of the Zohar's commentary on the Torah. I would guess, you know, 70% of the Zohar's commentary on the Torah. Uh, but it, it's hard to know. I don't know if we'll ever know. The clearest proof that he is the author, the main author, is, um, is to compare his Hebrew writings with the Zohar. Moses de Leon never admitted that he wrote the Zohar, but he writes many books in Hebrew where he says, I, Moses de Leon, am writing this book in the city of Guadalajara, Spain, that is, not Mexico, in Guadalajara in the year. He gives the year, he gives the place, he gives the title, and he writes books of Kabbalah. They're not as beautiful as the Zohar. They're not as poetic, but you can often tell that it's the same person. Uh, you can sometimes tell it's the same person because he'll he'll refer to the Zohar in his Hebrew writings and he'll refer to it in such a playful way. It seems that he's alluding to his own masterpiece that he never comes out and says he, he wrote. 
Maybe last question. Brian asks, is it possible to study the Zohar on your own? So it's a, it's a question I ask because even, I mean, today studying with you is an example of why it's so hard to study the Zohar on your own yeah. because, <laughs> because you are actually taking us through your notes, but you're explaining the notes and you're, you know, it, you are a master guide. So I, I assume someone could open up the Zohar, but on their own, I, I would find it to be very challenging without having someone to at least interact with and try to understand, yeah. and if not a master teacher, but do you have any thoughts about, I mean, that's why you have a whole class on Zohar yeah. is to help people, but right. anyway. Yeah, what, 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 what we do in the class is pretty much what we did today and move a little more slowly and uh, we spend more time. We look at parallels and stuff, but I would say, uh, I mean, I wrote, I wrote the commentary this way. You see how, how dense and, and extensive the commentary is. I wrote the commentary this way so that people could approach it on their own. I think if you move very slowly and carefully, if you have a Bible next to you, if you've studied some Bible, you can't make sense of the Zohar without some knowledge of the Bible. Okay, now let me say this. It's often said in traditional circles, you shouldn't open the Zohar until you've mastered not only the Bible, but the Talmud. You should study the whole Talmud and maybe Midrash and maybe Halakha. And you should study everything before you even venture into the Zohar. That's often been the traditional approach. My sense is that, you know, if we wait for people to do that, a tiny fraction of the Jewish population or the world's population will ever get to the Zohar. So I wrote the commentary uh, so that people could approach it if you're very careful, if you're very patient, if, you're, if you can work slowly with the Bible next to you, looking up occasionally things in the Talmud. Um, but it certainly helps to study with someone, with a teacher, and I, I can recommend my class highly. But there are other ways to do it. You can do it on your own. You can do it with a friend. You can do it with, a, with another teacher. There's so much of the Zohar is through dialogue. It's rabbis wandering on the road and exchanging secrets of Torah. So it helps a lot to study with someone. And some of the people in our course do chavruta, do a companion study. To study with someone and in a class is tremendous. But uh, I know a good number of people who have joined the class said, I bought your book. I bought volume one. I bought the first five volumes. I bought all 12 volumes. And I started reading it and I didn't get it anywhere. So I want to do a class. So some people really need the class. And I think many people benefit from the class. But some people, I think, uh, can, can begin on their own. If the class is too expensive for you, then email me and uh, we will work it out. The cost is not, is not a barrier. And uh, there, there are scholarship funds available. Thank you. So I want to wish you all great dreams tonight and um, a warning that, you know, don't tell your dreams to anybody you don't trust, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, right. Thank you for uh, taking us into this part of the Zohar today and um, being a master guide for all of us. It's really a treat to have you as our teacher. Uh, thank you all um, in the audience and participants as well for your great insights. And um, I will follow up this program with, Sending out the handouts again, as well as the uh, information about joining Professor Matt's class and some other materials that may be of interest to all of you. Look, looking forward to having you back next week for the final in this three-part series. And I guess the great thing is we could do three-part series for many years with Professor Matt, and hopefully we can do sure. that. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Take care. Shalom. Shalom.